Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion on media and virtual production. Second hour is uh, usually something we want to spend a little more time on today. We usually talk about education. Uh, we are going to have, I'm going to be on here for the first hour. Our own Tony Mobley is taking over at eight. So if you've got uh, technical questions about education or just ed education in general, uh, you can go ahead and ask those um, for that second hour. Uh, and we can continue with technical questions in general as well. Uh, Tony's going to, we're going to have the, we'll have, we'll be on YouTube from eight to nine, and then we'll turn off YouTube and we'll go to uh, just the educator getting together and talking amongst themselves. I have to run off to a production, uh, so I'll be leaving at, uh, at 8 o'clock. So get your questions in, and uh, and let's all uh, uh, welcome to Tony to take, taking over. It's his first, uh, his first hosting gig here, but probably not his last. All right, uh, let's jump into the first question. Thank you, Alex. Uh, the first question comes from Mark Giuliani in D.C. How is NAB going? Well, we're getting a lot of uh, pictures, um, so some folks are posting some pictures of all the the the, the different booths that are come. They they show up in on uh, pallets <laughs> wrapped, and they start unpacking them. So a couple of those pictures have been floating around both on the internet and in Discord, and so it's uh, it's happening. They're actually going to load in. The we were talking about it earlier that the booth, um, the Black Magic's booth is big <laughs> it's, it's the we think it's the biggest booth in the show uh and it looks like it's just a hair bigger than the sony one and i i don't think that that's by accident <laughs> so so i think that i think someone tried to figure out let's make it just slightly bigger um then <laughs> so anyway so um so it looks it looks to be really interesting. I think that there's I think one of the things we wanted to discuss is like what what do we actually want to see now it, the, in Discord if you're in Discord <laughs> there is a um NAB section now for 2022 uh and you should go there and let us know what kind of booths you want to see. I think that obviously Black Magic and Sony are pretty popular, but there's a lot of, you know, ones that I know I would love to see a little coverage of. I was kind of looking through um you know, the best thing to do is kind of go to their maps which were posted there kind of wander through and just see what what things jump out at you. Um, you know, I think that Atomos is usually something they have some new um, streaming tools that I think could be pretty interesting. So Atomos is something that I know that that I'd be interested in seeing. Um, Nanlite, of course, our friends at Nanlite <laughs> are going to be in the center in the central hall. Airy, uh, Riedel, um, those are all things that that look you know, Clearcom. Clearcom's got a whole new package um, that might be interesting of covering. That's something that I probably look at. Um, and so, uh, so I think that Sennheiser has the new, um, in-ear monitors. Aperture, of course, is great. Um, so these are just some of the ones as I look through them, I, a lot of times I do look through these maps and I go, what would I want to, you know, what am I going to go cover? So those are some of the ones, the Vitech production solutions, you know, they own like 10 things. So Vitech is usually a safe one to go to <laughs> in the central hall. Um, curious if anybody else has any, um, hit, hit lists. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. It's perhaps early for us to be able to see anything because I don't think the exhibit opens for a few hours yet. So I don't think we'll have anybody relaying any shots to us just yet. But if not uh, during our show, maybe uh, in after hours or in the third or fourth hour today. Yeah. Certainly mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yeah. And, and so there's, you know, there's lots of stuff. And there's, I always try to do stuff that is applicable to everyone. And then some of the stuff that is just like, it's interesting and you may not use it today but it's nice to know it's there so things like everett's um stipe uh those are those are all interesting everett's is in in my world they make a lot of the hardware that we use but it's pretty pretty pricey so uh so anyway so those are um you know of course ross video is right next to um black magic so ross video would be another one that i would um, definitely check out especially the stuff that some of our members uh, use so there, there's a bunch of virtual <clears throat> sets that i think it'll be great for us to cover so we should definitely make sure to, to check that out as well um i don't know if there's any other things that people uh, people uh, go, go ahead john i don't think the show floor opens till tomorrow i don't think it's open today conferences are open today but show floor opens tomorrow and and our team will be there doug doug actually has a meeting with ross tomorrow he bought oh, great. ross to replace his um uh, his tricaster so that's good news that's that's great <laughs> that's great um yeah so i think that'll be it'll be uh uh yeah it'd be interesting to see also if like studio technologies is coming out with any more dante products because we use a lot of their dante products and so they're hard to hard, as mitchell will tell you they're hard to get right now we were able to snag we're using the dante belt packs as well for our cameras in the stage uh, so, and, and that, those have worked out really well. It's just so nice to use Dante belt packs because they're so quiet. We're, we're so used to like the buzz of, you know, running, you know, something or the, the, the low quality, 
you know, kind of uh, wireless stuff that you get. I mean, even with even with a great thing like we free speak, it's, it's, it's super expensive. So we don't usually use it for unless we're on a show show. And um, so it's just so nice to have nice, quiet comms. So it's good. Uh, Roscoe. Now are the clear are they much lighter than the clear comms also? Or are they about the same weight? The bell packs? Uh, the bell packs are about the same weight. They're maybe a little bit. I mean, they're they're a little smaller than the than the standard analog belt packs from from Clearcom. Um, but the, the best thing is it's just Ethernet. I mean, you just pop Ethernet into the back of them, and there's some. You know, there's a four channel. I think we have a couple two channels and one four channel. I think we did that mostly because there weren't any more two channels that we could find. And so, uh, so, but that the um, and they come with four pin or five pin. You know, so that you can d d depending on what you want to do, and uh, they're just. Um, Here's they're good for small crews. They are not good for large crews. And the reason they're not look good for large crews is you have to build a mix minus for each one of them. And they've got some boxes that kind of do that, but you pretty much have to dedicate a whole mixer <laughs> to, to like, and someone has to really think through it. And that's what the 806 really help, helps with is building those mix minuses. Um, but the um, uh, it's 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 not a trivial problem, you know, to to support all of those belt packs. Um, and cause it's not as automatic and it, when you're using a clear comm system, you just kind of drag things like I want this and all that stuff gets built for you. And we don't get that with, uh, as much with the, uh, uh, with, with the Dante ones, but it's much easier to tie the belt packs into unity comm. So when we were doing the, the show that we did with Brian Vander Ark, you know, it's very easy to tie in. We have Marcia calling a show from Omaha, Nebraska and straight into the ears of the the camera operators and they're able to talk back and forth and it was it was remarkably seamless uh, go ahead mitchell it, oh go, go ahead roscoe what are you gonna say i was gonna say and are you using a flexible uh e ethernet cable of some sort or is it just whatever you got from the store whatever we got from the store <laughs> like or you know we just i think you know mono price you know ethernet cables or whatever yeah it's, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward go ahead mitchell is it kind of weird to have your dante plugged in and not know you're actually plugged in because like you said I'm used to the clear comms having a little yeah, button. Mean, yeah, yeah, it's it's it, it's awesome. You know, that's uh, all I can say. Is Apple so. displaying at the uh, NEB this year? I don't think they are. are. They Apple hasn't done anything on. So Apple is there, and you'll often one of the telltale signs that it's an Apple employee is that their badge is turned over. So uh, the, the Apple the Apple employees never never have their badge opened. They they always have it turned up. They only turn it open when they go into the hall, and they turn it back. They turn it back to. Um, there. So if it's set that way, like not just twisted over, but like literally it's been put on upside down, there's like a, in my experience, there's like a 50% chance that's Apple. <laughs> so, so there'll probably be 50 or 60 Apple employees roaming around NAB. Um, they have their own meetings, they have their own stuff. You know, they, you know, they meet with lots of people, they've got their own suite. There's a lot of things that Apple does there, but, um, but they don't, they don't, they haven't done a, they haven't done a convention in, they're ahead of all of us. <laughs> they haven't done a convention. I think in 15 years, I, th I, I think that it was Macworld was the last convention that they did. I think that was 2007 or 2008 is when they, I think, I don't remember when the last Macworld was, but somewhere in that ballpark. And, um, no, but that was the end of, uh, Apple's, con they don't, I don't, I don't really, it doesn't appear that it affected their sales at all. Um, they used to show, they used to appear at the super meets, uh, but I think the final cut might have been the, the final cut 10 one was the beginning of the end of Apple wanting to be at, at, the, at, at those kinds of things. Um, right, next question. And it's from Roscoe Jones in Bray, California. For documenting classic European theaters, LIDAR, photo photogrammetry, walkthroughs and videos of stage machinery demos, one tool being considered, budget $700, is the GoPro Max 360 to Oculus. Will it work? Um, the... I have the I have I think I have the precursor to this um, this one yeah I have I I mean I I, uh, I only know the there's a GoPro Max that is less than that that I was, I was looking for to see if it's like four hundred dollars is there Roscoe is there a is this a new one is this different uh, no it's four hundred ninety nine it's been out a couple of years um, but okay. he's trying to do uh, video walkthroughs around using the ambient light. And then I guess the question is for photogrammetry. I've asked you this before. We were talking about a large light source so that he can do decent photogrammetries. The LIDAR shouldn't be a problem, I hope. But the, Yeah. Is, is he using LIDAR? Yeah. He's trying to do a full documentation of these classic theaters in Europe. He's got a grant, but his grant isn't super huge. Right. I mean, so the thing to do is to, you know, you might want to not, might not want to buy a LIDAR unit, but you might want to consider someone might want to consider renting a, a lidar unit 
um, the ones that have been used for this kind of um, this kind of process, there's a there's a company that does actually, I can't think of the name of it right now, but there's a company that actually goes to historical sites and digitizes them. Like it's it's what they you know they're it's a nonprofit that does what he's talking about doing. Um, they're yeah. using, I believe, a Faro 350, which is a relatively somewhat expensive lidar system, but it is, but you can rent it, you know, for the week or whatever. And it's remark. You shouldn't be worried. It's remarkably easy to use. I mean, the okay. the Faro 350 is something that I mean, I don't know. I find it pretty. You know, it's there's like a half an hour of what which way is up and reading the manual, and then the big thing. And they, if he's interested, we have people. You know, I, I think Mark knows a lot about it. Um, I have a friend that owns a couple of the 350s, um, and so we can talk through what those what those are. But that's gonna, you know, you you go down and you you start covering. You can really cover the whole space really quickly. The big thing is is that you want that. It's you can try to do it with your phone. The phone is gonna be very low resolution in 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 relation to that, and it only throws 30 feet. Right. So what happens is is that you you get into a situation where you can't get high enough. Like you just things just become not something you can cover. And so right. now the reality is is that the the um so the, the especially in an indoor environment. Uh, the photogrammetry gets a lot harder because of the light, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And so it it it, it becomes it, it's more of a challenge. And so I would I would recommend, yeah, the lidar makes a lot of sense. And then around areas that you want a lot of details, where you want to get some photogrammetry. And and in those cases, I would say you know giant china balls, you know, are pretty good to just right. right. Yeah, the biggest problem is is that with photogrammetry, you're capturing both. The, the, the biggest challenge you'll have is that in photogrammetry, you're capturing both the texture information as well as the geometry. So you might get great geometry, but if you light it artificially, it just may look weird, you know, as you as you do it. If you don't light it in one, so you kind of have to look at a, what I've seen people do in some cases is figure out how to light the whole room in a certain way and then digitize the whole room that way. But it has to look natural to your eye. Otherwise, you're going to capture it in a way that it's, it's hard. And more diffuse is better because you can also relight it later if it's really a diffuse um source but you're going to see that source somewhere yeah, so what kind of data load are we looking at to do a theater i mean any idea um you know i would i would i'd budget um i'd probably budget four terabytes a, a location four you terabytes know, per location for me okay. yeah okay <laughs> like that's what that's what i would if, if i was going there that's what it would take to do because i would i would okay. use the, the the camera that i would use for that would be more of a um, I would use the Sony um, A7R, uh, A seven R, A A seven R four, which does okay. sixty one megapixel images. Megapixels mean everything to you when you're right. doing the photogrammetry. Stitching. And the key is there is to not, you know, I would get either a fixed lens or I would have a lens that locks, like the twenty four to seventy Canon L series will lock, you know, in, at twenty four, mm -hmm. so that you can't change it. If you change the focal length, you're done. <laughs> like you're, like, you know, so you're like, you know, and, and 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 then the other thing you want to think about is even focus. You want to have the the deepest focus that you can have. So that's where light becomes important as well. So you want to be able to um you know be at f stop eleven or higher. You know, otherwise your depth of field starts to become a challenge. But if you have a wide angle lens with an f stop eleven, not not fisheye, but like twenty four or or something like that, and and you're um uh uh you know, and then there's just a lot of overlap. But it, it, the the other thing I would say is get the tools that you're going to get before you go there. Unless he's already there. No, oh, wow. no, he's, we're going to do a test this summer before he leaves in our I, theaters. And then, yeah, I would, I would do it over and over and over again and, you know, and, and, and bring up questions to this panel and we'll, um, you know, and we're happy to talk, talk through those things, but it's, it's, uh, cause the worst part is I've, I have done many things where I flew to some part of the world and did it and then it, you know, didn't turn out and then you can't go back. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I went to Angkor Wat four times. <laughs> I just kept on finding excuses to go so I could keep on making mistakes. Finally got some footage out of it or finally got some geometry out of it. Uh, go ahead, Mark. So a lot of this really depends on what you're going to use the data for. Uh, the LiDAR files are huge and create very large point clouds. And then there's uh, different systems and technologies to bring that into something like Revit for creating a, a building information model that will allow you to use that information. Um, the best thing to do with the technology changing so much is, as Alex said, just rent the equipment and they'll train you how to use it for a small fee because it just, it, it is, uh, it's not that it's complicated. You just need a lot of horsepower with the computers to handle the point clouds. And if we have time, I mean, if, if the timing's right, I might be able to get a LIDAR, you know, for us to play with. 
and then we can do the test with it, you know, for a week, you know, or for a couple of days in LA. I mean, I can, Fred, sometimes I had it for, <laughs> our timing is bad. I had the LiDAR sitting in my house for like a month. <laughs> so, so I was, I was capturing some stuff. And, um, and so I, you know, and I kept on meaning to go down to LA and, you know, never made it. Go ahead, Roscoe. I was going to say, yeah, his his goal is to get this down to Oculus so that a student can, you know, be in a lab or walk into a computer, put on an Oculus headset, and he can describe and say, go look in this corner and then maybe run a demo. Here's how this particular stage machinery works at this theater. And that's his yep. goal is for what, teaching support. The other thing I would I would look at is is look at um, the remeshing tools inside of cinema that they just announced, but they they moved Z remesh. Z remesh came out of um, ZBrush. ZBrush was the, and ZBrush is one of the best things to do remeshing. What remeshing does, it's going to do a intelligent decimation of the geometry. So basically it's going to take this really dense point cloud and it, because to, to, to work in Oculus, you're going to have to go from 350 million polygons to like 4 million polygons or 2 million polygons to even be able to operate inside of it, maybe right. even lower yeah. to, to right. you know, so, so how do you get down to that? And that's what remeshing and decimation tools do is allow you to intelligently, because what they're doing is they're looking at where are the curves, where are the edges and maintaining those edges while taking large surfaces that are largely the same and getting rid of a lot of the geometry, you know, for that. And so those are things you want to want to think about, but yeah, please, uh, Experiment and keep on coming back with questions. It's an exciting Thank project. You. Yeah, absolutely. We'll uh, next question. Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, what would make you go back to NAB if you decided not to go anymore? John? I'm not going anymore, Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> I, grew, I grew up going to conventions. I went to the first CES in 1976, where we bought a Commodore PET computer for $200. And uh, going to NAB for 20 years. It's Comdex ought to be your bellwether for how broken the convention business is. It's been gone now for almost eight, 20 years, 18 years, I think. 2004 was the last Comdex. It was the biggest convention of them all. Almost 200,000 people used to go. So the, using the internet to find out products and to meet people, I've met more interesting people in office hour in two years than I had 20 years of NAB. Yeah, and I think that that's the trend, is that you know we're the, the trend is against large physical events. I am not saying that there won't be physical events. <laughs> you know, though people always think that I'm like anti in person. I, I think that there's plenty of things that, you know, theater didn't go away with film. Theater's still thriving. So it's not that that it um but the big game is going to be online. <laughs> you know, the, the, you know that's where all the, all the big money is going to end up going in the next decade. Um because it's just you know when you do a physical event, you're cutting out 99.99999% of your addressable market. Now, that didn't matter when we didn't have the internet. When we didn't have the internet, they weren't going to make it anyway. But now we do, so we're past that. And so, as as our ability to get out there um, and in front of people becomes, you know, more refined, I think that it's it's uh, it's difficult to justify, you know, the the process. And so, so I think that that every everybody that I know that has got a booth at NAB is kind of like, well, we're going this year, you know, like it's it's you know, we'll see how it goes, and we want to support them. We know it's been hard. No one's talking about how exciting it is <laughs> to go anymore. Like it's 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 a uh, I don't I don't hear anybody. I mean, there's the people who are running events there. They're really excited to be able to do it again. But a lot of the folks, a, a lot of everyone's kind of looking at it sideways. Of of like, um, I don't know how long I will keep doing this. I go ahead, Roscoe. Uh, if John was about to launch a rocket again, and a bunch of cool people are going to show up, I might wonder by NAB if he did it that same weekend. There you it's go. It's all about community. But if I had a budget, if you sometimes if you if you're handed a budget and you say I have to, I have a month to spend on you know, and I have to buy camera systems and I have to buy an editing system. Sometimes it's nice to be able to go to one place and do your hands-on shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah. If I could stay at Preto's house, I would consider it. You know, avoid the uh, hotel. Allow me. You got an extra bedroom there. I'll uh, I'll be very quiet. The one that thing I was be- thinking. I was thinking about is like the one thing is is like looking at the products and i realized you know we have this big stage that i'm testing i wonder if we could get product get folks after nab to come and do demos in our in our little stage for second hours that'd be a lot of fun i think people will be into that so let's um, stay tuned for that uh next question another question for me how can a zoom webinar benefit from mukana well this one does <laughs> so the 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 question and the question and uh, comment tools and in the webinar are limited. <laughs> so, so we'll say it that way. And, um, 
And so I think that being able to add Mukana as a second screen experience where you can ask those questions. But I think that they, I think that Mukana um, benefits many anything that doesn't have a Q&A system, because I think I still think I obviously I feel very strongly that Q&A and interaction with the audience is the is the future. Go ahead, Mitchell. Can't hear you, Mitchell. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you can hear us. I can't hear you, Mitchell. Sync is perfect. Nope. <laughs> you did it yourself. Yeah. What are you doing? It's it, not yeah. working. It's not working. What, what are you using? What do you use to turn the mic on and off? It's not. It's um, not I have finally uh, devolved to using a keyboard sh shortcut, but I think I've worn the button out on my keyboard. I think, I think you just need to click on the little mic. That's what I do. I think you're right. Yeah, okay. I think you're right. Um, I was saying that um, I, you know, a typical radio talk show, I can see lots of uses for it because it gives you. Not only does it give you the ability to communicate with your listeners, but uh, the production staff can be wherever they want to be. The producer could be somewhere pushing questions. Um, if there's an issue that comes up, you can communicate quickly. Yep. I didn't know that I needed Mukana until I had it to try out. Yeah, yeah we have a, an event. That's what, what I'm running off to. We have an event today, and the folks that are approving the questions are in L.A., uh, the people helping work through them are in Minnesota and uh, and, and San Francisco. And... Um, the uh and then the 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 people who are the, the host i think is in colorado there's a person in france there's a person you know there's people all over that are answering those questions but it's all completely distributed to a, an audience to a couple audiences that are in a couple of locations and so the, the audiences are in physical locations and then the 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 thing's all remote and it's all being put you know piped into those locations it's quite a um it makes it a lot yeah a lot easier so, so I think that those are, um, I think that it's going to be really interesting as we kind of move forward. So stay tuned for more there. We will be, um, experimenting as a note in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a podcast. Um, and I'm not ready to announce the, the name of it yet, but we're working on a podcast with a, with a, with a partner who's been on the show, um, who does a lot of radio. And, um, anyway, the, uh, he's going to be doing interviews and we're going to have us have the opportunity to be part of the live audience and ask questions as well. So, it, so I think it's going to be, we're going to be experimenting with the radio show style um, thing for a podcast here in just the next couple of weeks. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, next question. It's from JJ McKenna in Santa Venetia, California. How will the stream mob ensure that our correspondents in the field to have the questions office hours is raring to have answered by the NAB exhibitionist? Um, I think that, I don't know what the, I don't, uh, I think we just have to figure out how they're gonna. I mean, we we have um, Mukana to use that for that. I'm not sure. I don't know what. Uh, I don't know what 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 part of that mechanics we don't have. So, so I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, next question. And it's for me again. Um, I know that uh, there's a cloud lifter booster for dynamic mics, but is there one out there that can boost a condenser microphone? Yeah, mix pre three. Mix pre. <laughs> yeah. so, you, you, you need you need something that has uh, enough gain in it to, to be able to ma manage the mic. So that's the real challenge. The the actually the, the one that I would probably think about if I just wanted to amplify a mic uh, is the MM1. The sound device is MM1. Um, it is a it is a mic input with a a line output, and you can also have a you know you can you can get some audio in as well. It's usually used, we used to have lots of them for this, for this specific thing, converting line, uh, mic to line. And it's got a, it's got a good, a really good, I mean, one of the top preamps. It doesn't have a preamp as good as the mix pre's and so on and so forth, but it, because it's a last generation, but it's still a very good amp with a, with a um, limiter. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I asked the question because as uh, a panelist mic checker, um, I noticed that since we get to uh, minus 20 luffs on the meter that we use to set the levels for everybody, um, some people have a real hard time reaching that. Um, others do not. But I'm wondering if there was something they could put in line and just give them a little little help there. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with us dropping. Now that we're doing the stream and the stream is stable, here's the problem was, is that at negative 24, the raw stream out of Zoom was too quiet. Like it, people talked about it a lot. And it was a problem and it was, you know, people, uh, I got complaints about it, you know, and then when I, I finally opened it up on YouTube, I was like, wow, that's really low. Like compared to everything else on YouTube, we were running really low at negative 24 lefts. Um, and so, cause so the, so I wanted to move to 20 now that we, now that we feel stable in office hours 2.0, I'm okay with going back to negative 24 if we want to, because I can bump that audio up in. Um, in the pipeline. 
So if we want to go back to negative 24, I'm just going to say it here. I'm not going to send out any emails. But if, if, if all of you can agree to go to negative 24 again, just to make it easier for the mics to get up there, I'm fine with going back to negative 24. We just need to know what day we're going to start doing that. And someone just needs to send me a Discord saying we're going back to 20, negative 24 on Monday or whatever that is. And then I will shift the pipeline in the office to go to, to negative 20, just to go up another 4 dB, you know, in the office. And that should be fine. Go ahead, Roscoe. Mickey's asking for negative 27, so uh, maybe we should uh, defer. I always like Mickey because he's, you know, whatever Mickey stuff wants. Wired. Mickey exactly. gets what Mickey wants. So, and, and the cloud, yeah, and back to the original question of the cloud lifter problem is the cloud lifter itself steals the 48 volt, 48 volt phantom power. So, I don't know how you're going to get around that unless, unless you're in a mixing board. I think that is the right answer. Yeah. The, the only thing I'll say about negative 27, the other problem we have is we just have to remember that someone naturally coming into Zoom, like if they just have a webcam, we don't have control over their audio. If they don't have control over their audio, they're going to come in at negative 17, which we saw in after hours. Like that's what that's what Zoom will automatically send them to. So we just have to know that we're running much lower than every than um, than Zoom is. So that's just something else for us to kind of consider, you know, as we as we look at it, we just have to, that a, a second hour might be a little bit more work um, to make that work or might be a little off. So. But I, let, let's go to negative 24. I don't I think 27 seems really low to me. Um, but uh, let's 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 compromise and go for the negative twenty four for for now and see how it goes. Um, next uh, next question, and it's from Douglas Carmichael. What would be the most effective strategy for developing keyboard playing skills? I'm using Melodics. There's a link for it. At least fifteen to twenty minutes a day. But what other strategies would you recommend? Practice. <laughs> Practice. I, I I don't know what the I don't know what the scientific uh, uh, way to do this is. I can tell you the way my my daughter learns, she's learns a lot of stuff and she sits there on YouTube and she just plays the videos, and, but she practices for hours and she, she, she plays a video. They've got these little ones where the keyboard, you know, like you see the keyboard and it's like typing and it has the thing and she just literally starts, stop, start, stop. And then she, she just puts her, she starts doing it and she does it with the bass as well as, and the guitar. <laughs> so, so, so she's, um, and it's, but it's a, it's a, it's just a lot of, I mean, I don't think that there's a lot of a lot of ways to avoid just an enormous amount of practice of actual songs and the more different songs make you do different things. Go ahead, Roscoe. A lot of colleges actually have uh, labs and videos. And so I'd maybe investigate a few colleges around you and just see if they have a lab. They will actually tell you, you know, about hand position and various things that mm -hmm. supposedly help you, you know, be maintain uh, being able to play throughout a very long time. And I would consider having a, uh, you know, trying to find a teacher that you might meet with once a week for those kinds of things. And the reason for that is that practice doesn't make perfect practice makes permanent. And so you want to make sure that you're doing everything correctly with your hands when you get started. It's actually one of my, this is a slightly different subject, but one of my pet peeves about baseball is that we have the most inexperienced people coaching five-year-old and six-year-old and seven-year-old kids to play baseball. And it's when they figure out how to throw. I, I had to take a whole year to re, rebuild my my mechanism, my throwing mechanism, um, so that I could. And it, I mean, it was dramatically different, you know, from because I, I didn't know anything. I just threw a lot, and I practiced a lot when I was a kid. So when I got to high school, you know, my throwing, I could muscle something out, but I couldn't play a whole game the way I threw the ball. And um, I had to I had to rebuild my mechanism, and that was painful, you know, to do that. And um, and so start start well. That's all I got to say. Start well. All right. Next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia. Please explain NAB to a person who has never been there. Go ahead, John. NAB is the National Association of Broadcasters. So everybody related TV and radio, all the engineering folks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then as gear goes, you've got consumer level products. Then you've got industrial level product. Then you have broadcast gear, which is the top of the line stuff. And the great thing about NAB for me, when I first went, used to judge uh, an industry by their trade shows. And some of these booths back 20 years ago, discreet for, for one that came into my mind was, I don't know, 200 feet long when they had Inferno and Flint and Flame and all those products. It was spectacular. But one of my funnest thing to do was go to the Sony booth where they had the big box cameras and they have, they have actors sitting there at the set all day long and you can zoom in on yeah. a bowl of fruit and stuff. And so you got to do, and that's a, I don't know how much those cost, $300,000, those cameras. And you got to, you know, they've got the motorcycle grips on them there. So you got to play with all that really expensive gear. And then they've got tons of 
conferences for people wanting to do education and engineering and te technique, lighting techniques, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead, Mitchell. It has evolved quite a bit from what it used to be. When I think back in the, the golden years of NAB, uh, I remember going into a booth uh, called um, uh, New Tech, and Kiki Stop Camera was there, and it was a, uh, a complete, uh, uh, ch you know, sea change in the way things were being done. Um, you don't see that so much anymore. I think Kiki's so still there. there. Yeah, she's still there. Good for her. There. Good for <laughs> Kiki. Um, it, it nowadays it's just not quite so earth shattering. I didn't have to go there to see that ooh wow moment or discovery. Um, and I guess there's less and less more reasons for people to go. But all the things that uh, John said. Uh, and then some. I, I liked it for the camaraderie. A uh, great place to meet up with other people that you've been talking to all year, but um, not so much anymore. You know, I, I, while you talked about that, it might, it might be fun to get Kiki to come on and talk about like the progression of her experience of NAB. Maybe maybe right after NAB, she's probably. I think she's. I, I actually think she's there. If she's not. We should. Someone should find out if Kiki's there. If she's not, <laughs> I'll ping her and see if we can get her to come on. It'd be fun to have her on. Because she's seen it. I mean, she's seen it all. Like she's seen the, the the this progression of of all of this, and she's been up there in the middle of it for a long time. She and she's a lot. Of, she's a lot of fun. She she'd be really fun for a second hour. Uh, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, she has her own fan club. I'm sure from NAB people just go to find her. But, she's in a uh, band. Think, no. Oh, oh, there you go. Them, we should get them to play. We should get them to play. It's a Star Trek band. Go. <laughs> very cool i was just gonna my description would be find a wedding reception that's kind of crowded and you have to mm -hmm. negotiate the tables and then put that over seven football fields that's what right. nab is like yeah and the big thing is is that it's just it for a long time it's the every every manufacturer that had to do with any kind of video was there um and it's still and a lot of them are still there but it is a lot smaller now and probably uh, have to figure out its uh, restructuring um, I think that there's a huge opportunity to do these kinds of things online. I don't think that that, I, I don't think anything's going away. I just think that it's got to take a new form. Um, next question. And a question from James Fosling from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Does the loss of Netflix subscribers suggest a sea change or is Netflix doing something wrong? Go ahead, Eric. You know, I, I actually think it's more a reflection of the marketplace and how strong the content is. Um, just recently, an article came out that said HBO has overtaken Disney Plus to become the third largest streaming platform. I think that's actually uh, what's happening to Netflix is they're starting to uh, see a lot of competition that's going to make a big, big difference for them in the future. Now, obviously, they're pumping billions of dollars into their content. And I think that's going to keep them uh, first for a while. But I think there's there's going to be a lot more that follow on. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, like Eric says, I mean, being the first allowed them a lot of latitude, but now they're competing with everybody else out there that can add a plus next to their name. And HBO is certainly selling uh, quality over quantity. Netflix has quantity down, but any Netflix subscriber like myself, we spend a lot of time digging through a lot of material in order to find something worth watching. Yeah, I mean, they're they're really obsessed with the um, the algorithm that tells you what to watch. I just don't find it's very good. And I find that they do a lot of things that make it hard for me to find things. Like it, it, it actually feels like they're trying to get me to roam more. Like for instance, I really like watching standups. <laughs> just I just love standups. And but I sometimes when I open up Netflix, there's a whole shelf of standups. And then the next time I log in, it's not there. Now I have to go off into the into the woods. And like I'm like, if you just left the standups there, I'd probably pay for. I stopped paying for Netflix. And I was like, if you if you because 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 I couldn't find the standups, I was like, I'm tired of like because that's, that's usually what I want to feel. Like I don't have time to get into some long series. I don't care about a, a big arc. I just want to just stop for a little bit at the end of the day. And um and the and and I find that they make it hard by keep on switching around what I have in my shelves. And I get that they're trying to get me to do other things. I don't want to do anything else. You know, I think that you could build, you know, and, and I, I just want to go and, and I think they, they misunderstand that. Um, I also think that we all know that their their movies are good and fun and none of them are great. <laughs> like, like, like none of them are, I don't know what it is about Netflix, but like none of the, you know, like that red notice or whatever it was. When I went into it, a bunch of fun actors, it was really great. And it's, you know, it, obviously it checked off a bunch of bo boxes, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, it's not like I left going, oh, I have to watch that again. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, we just moved my mom into an assisted living place and uh, in the process of managing her uh, uh, expenses, we cut her Netflix uh, account off. And all of a sudden I started hearing screams from across the country 
from brothers and sister saying, wait a minute, what happened to my Netflix? Right. They've been all using her, her password. And I think what Netflix has done is not that money's getting a little tight for them. Uh, they're concerned about the number of people sharing uh, passwords in a family. They should all well, they're working on that too. <laughs> like yeah. I think they're about to cut us off. And so, so I think that the, and, I, and again, I am slowly getting rid of the reason I stopped doing Netflix is because I can't, I can't manage my subscription through Apple, my, my Apple TV. And so I'm slowly making decisions about everything. You know, I'm not doing it all at once, but I'm starting to cut things off. If I can't manage it through Apple TV, I'm not gonna. And I think that this is the whole push of separate um, things has made me very uh, polarized in that if someone wants me to, sign up for something outside of Apple's ecosystem, I won't, I just won't do it. And I won't do any new ones. And now I'm just slowly turning off the old ones that, that are, that are not letting me um, just buy it through the Apple system because it's, it's a, if we let that go through, it'll be painful. Now, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, all RF scanners sold in the U.S. still block the 800 megahertz analog cellular bands despite all U.S. cellular networks abandoning analog technology years ago. Do you think the FCC will ever repeal that law? And have you ever had issues with said block? Go ahead, Roscoe. Uh, the police and the police fire EMS. A lot of those systems, uh, trunk systems, are in that 800 megahertz. So no, they're going to keep that protected. I can't say. Anything. Okay, next question. Uh, it's from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Discord voting on NAB booths to visit Monday has gotten a lot of attention. What question or product is the panel most interested in the booth that you voted for? Well, obviously, if there's going to be, if, if Blackmagic announces any new cameras, we're going to be really interested in the cameras. I'm also hoping that we see a Ethernet-based switcher from Blackmagic. Um, we have Ethernet-based cameras. <laughs> so, you you know, it'd be, it, it, what's funny is, is Blackmagic has an 8K switcher and no 8K camera. Blackmagic has an has a Ethernet based camera and it has no switcher, so I feel like these two worlds need to you know come together. <laughs> so so we're hoping that uh, that's the number one thing that I'm hoping to see. Um, and then I'm really interested in what Terra Terranex or Terra Deck is doing. What um, uh, you know what we might see from Atomos uh, or, or or even look at the Atomos stuff. It's pretty interesting as well. Um, any, any more? Next question. And Ryan Rademan from Chicago, Illinois, asked the question, looking for an HDMI splitter with HDMI input to dual HDMI output. Intent is for the output to always be mirrored. Uh, bonus points if it has numerous inputs. Uh, go ahead, Peter. There you go. What is it? It's Geffen. Can't hear you, Peter. It's an REI um, HDMI splitter. Copies the and optionally copy the EIED I the thing across. It's one in, two out. It is absolutely a mirror. Doesn't do anything else. Just mirrors it. It'll do 4K at 30 frames per second. It's perfectly good for monitors. It's I, I wouldn't necessarily use it for anything else than monitors. Uh, and it's uh, nice thing about it is it's it's USB. It's a uh, it can draw its power from a, just a normal USB power supply. That's nice. That's cool. So it's R E, what is it? R I E or R E I? R E I. I got it on Amazon. Okay. I found it on there Amazon. You there you go. Mitchell? Um, it's, it's dangerous uh, to buy them off of Amazon because I've got a bunch of them just lying around here. Some work, some do not work. And I think it has to do with the handshaking for copyright protection uh, causes an issue. Um, the other thing is if it has multiple inputs on it, it's not a splitter anymore, it's um, a switcher. Uh, next question. Next question comes to us from Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. I'm in the market for a new interface. Please offer the insight into the cleanest gain options at two hundred to three hundred dollars. I'm not sure what kind of an interface, but that's what they said. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, so I'm looking for an audio interface, and um, right now I have this uh, UMC22, which is about forty-five dollars. And uh, it has a fair amount of noise um, in driving the microphone I have, which is a E100S. So the question is, uh, what do we have in the two to three hundred dollar range? That you know, I've heard like the Motu M2. Um, there's some others in that range, but I'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts are. I think I would lean in that range to the, towards the Flow Eight. Like the, the Flow Eight seems to give you a lot of. The other one that I would look at that I'm testing, but I haven't come down on. But I know other people that. Are looking for interfaces is this revelator 
Uh, this is the IO24, and it has, what's nice about it, you can have filtering and stuff that's built into it. Um, so you can, you know, there's a little bit of work there. This is Persona. So the Revelator IO24, and I think it's at about that range. This or the Flow 8 would be the ones that I'd probably lean towards. Uh, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, if you go back into officehours.global and look at the look for the Flow 8, Carl did a wonderful uh, demo of all the features of the Flow 8. It'll sell it to you in a minute. Yeah. And if you can't get it, in the, I don't know if it's shipping in the United States, but also go into Discord and ask and or after hours. And there's people who will order it for you in the UK or you can order it from the UK and it'll come in and say about the same price. A little yeah, more. Tweetwater Tow Man. Yeah. It is It is in, in Sweetwater now? It, yeah, it was last time I checked. Yeah. Oh, great, great, great. It was it was delayed in Sweetwater for a while. Um, I guess Behringer cut back. So it's like they have like two distributors or something now and, the, and Sweetwater is one of them. Um, next question. And it's from Eduardo Augustine in Panama City. How did you ensure clients starting your production business? You know, I have to say that I kind of fell into it. <laughs> like I was doing everything I've done pretty much. I've just ended up showing up in the right place at the right time, you know, for it and uh, and have the tools that are necessary. So I didn't really, I, we were doing all subscription, you know, Pixelcore was all just people uh, having us, um, uh, you know, just, we were just training people around the world and people who came to our class said, Hey, could you do a little bit of work for us? And someone else said, could you do a little bit of work for us? And before we knew it, we were a full-time production business. When I was doing it before I went to ILM, you know, I always had a, my day job was in the early nineties was a, uh, was a DJ. So I DJed, uh, weddings, uh, on the weekends. So Friday through Sunday was really busy, but the rest of the week was Friday evening through Sunday was really busy. The rest of my days were pretty pretty empty. And so I filled those with learning how to do graphics and doing things for almost nothing for people, um, designing their business cards, designing other things like that. I, what I don't do is I, what I've never done is just jump out and try to start a business from scratch. So I, I might feel your pain there if, you, if that's what you're doing. I always, I've always had three jobs, one that I'm trying to get to, one that I'm that pays the bills and one that I'm trying to get rid of that used to pay the bills. It's like a big tank track for me. Like this is the next thing that'll pull me forward. And I, once I'm, you know, once that there's, there's always something for me in the, in, in front of that. And that might be when I owned a company that was always just where the company was trained, was going as opposed to where I was going. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah. The road is littered with the bones of people that have tried things. And, uh, I, I, I can look back when I first started my first business and uh, I was using the uh, the theory that if you build it, they will come. That's extraordinarily dangerous. In my case, I built it, sat there and said, all right, what do I do now? Because they aren't going to beat a path to your uh, door just because you put the uh, place together. In my case, um, I called a large uh, agency in town with help developing uh, my logo. And at one point in the conversation, they said, what do you do? I said, oh, I've got a multimedia studio. And they said, stop. And it turned out, they turned out to be my biggest and best client for 10 years. That's great. So uh, that was just pure luck. So uh, again, if you build it, they won't necessarily come. The, the other thing I would say is try to get involved with other people. You know, again, this is, um, you know, office hours is a great example of this where, you know, we're, you know, I think a lot of us are hiring each other you know, to do things for each other, but people have to know that you can do it. And the only way for them to know that is to be on the panel to be in after hours, to be part of the projects, to be, you know, volunteer for things to, and be part of that whole system. Um, it, it, it's some, it's a slow burn thing. It's not something that you're going to, you know, that's going to yield something in a month, but over years, this is how, I don't know, this is how I've survived for a long time <laughs> is that I have a very, very large and deep net of friends. And when they need me to come over and do just help out with something, I go over and help out with it. When they, when they have a job for me, I work on it. You know, those are, those are all things that, and, but that's a very complex net. And I think a lot of production people don't get it. Like they just think that I'll just keep doing my thing and that, you know, I don't, you know, and I'll, that'll, that'll last forever. And it's, it's pretty limited when you don't, when you don't uh, integrate better. Go ahead, Eric. Well, I was just going to say, I think sales skills are really important in this, you know, whether you're an artist, whether you're a designer, that sales is about presenting yourself to the right people at the right time. And that means calling people and just presenting yourself. And I know that's really difficult for artists to do. Uh, it was difficult for me to at the beginning to say, hey, you know, I've got these things I can do. What do you want me to do with it? I started out in 2000 that way. And I said, hey, I can design some signs for you. And the guy said, well, I don't need you to design the signs, but I need you to make the signs and give them to me. And I said, all right, well, how do I do that? And that began the process of building a business like that. 
So I think sales skills really are important and uh, boning up on those processes could be helpful. Yeah, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, same idea. Um, go work with a producer. And then sometimes there's a little niche of the business that he doesn't want. And just ask, but make sure you ask. Just say, hey, do you mind if I go work with this client? Or do you mind if I go work in this area? Um, don't steal business from them. That'll that'll get you backwards real quickly because then you won't, you know, you need to keep working with people. But a lot of times there is that opportunity. Or sometimes you develop something. Maybe you have a, maybe you're really good in skateboard sales or something. So you say, hey, I'm going to go over here and work in my skateboard uh, demo video area or something along those lines, but uh, pick those areas off, but it's always good to have that mentor. Yep. Um, next question. Uh, this is from Vincent Alvarez in Bellingham. Back in the day, 1980s at NAB, swag was pretty nice. Full-size flashlights, briefcase type bags, mini tool cases. What are some of the most impressive swag you've seen at NAB and the most useful? Go ahead, Mitchell. Um, I kind of refer to it not as swag, but swag or tchotchkes or tchotchkes. Um, for me, I got a camera once, you know, it's been so long. I can't remember what it was, but it was like a small, <laughs> obviously it wasn't that effective. Can't it, was, what it, is. it was very old and very bad. That's all I can tell you. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Roscoe. High quality hats are always a favorite of mine. I still have a hat that says Lulu on it. People look at me like, what is that from? And it's from some graphics company that went bankrupt years ago, but I still use it for, you know, changing the oil in the car and that kind of stuff. Um, things for kids. Uh, I used to bring home, the, they'd be like bouncy balls that when you bounce them, all of a sudden they'd sparkle, you know, that kind of stuff. My kids love that kind of stuff. So I think a lot of times you can appeal to parents who are there and they can bring stuff home for their kids and they will love it. The thing that I still use, there's a little box. There's a company that makes uh, these yellow, crates that are for moving AV gear or, or just storing cables, that kind of stuff. And they would give away miniatures of it. And my keys have been in those for years. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitchell. Tweakers. You now the small tweakers with the, uh, with the company's name on it, with a Phillips head on it and a small blade on the other side. And I bet uh, Alex is reaching for one. There it is. That's a tweaker. So it's, this is the maker bit one that, that uh, Roger sent us. He sent it when we were working on the maker bit. You needed this and uh, it, I keep it on my desk. I use it all the time. So it's, Love um, those things. yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the thing that I've used the most from NAB. I, I, the, the key is when you design those things is to, uh, think about how people would use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Not like, how do you make something that's really, really cool? I think t-shirts, I mean, I have a couple of t-shirts. I have a frame IO one that Emery gave me when, when I was talking to him on the, at the booth and I've got a couple other cool t-shirts that I got, um, in that, you know, some, I have Modo and, XSI and Cinema 4D and, you know, all these other ones of, of places that I, you know, of, of booths that I was at or places that I spoke or whatever. Um, so I think those are, those are a lot of fun. Um, the, the best one that I ever gave out, this isn't NAB, but you think of all these crazy things. So I used to be in PR and uh, I, uh, I built a waste paper basket. <laughs> so I was, I was uh, um, promoting a band called Ned's Atomic Dustbin. So this was, a, I was working for Sony at the time. And so I have these radio stations and, and so I built this and I, and we, uh, I had, I, it was like arts and crafts project for each one of them. And it took me like two hours to build each one of these. And it was like 11 of them. So it was like half a week of me building these things, but they had, they, they looked like a nuclear reactor and had Ned's Atomic Dustbin on it and everything else. And I sent them to all the music directors and every one of them that I visited had it next to their desk. Like it was just, and, and the thing is I, what I did is I took something that is, that is always, almost always basic you know, in, a, in an office and I made it cool. And I, and I, and I had this guess that they would all, that they would, that that, that would be better than the waste paper basket that they had. And it, and it was, <laughs> so, so it was, and it was everywhere. And, and I took pictures of them and sent them to my manager all the time. <laughs> like, like, Hey, I guess there's another one. Cause she thought I was crazy. Um, next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama. How's the experience with stream voodoo? Have you been able to test it? It ended up uh, going back to OBS Ninja. We've been doing tests with it and it's been great. I mean, for us, what, we're not doing as much interaction work as much as we are like, hey, I need a video from this person's screen and their and their camera and everything else and just send me a link uh, of it. That's what's really cool about it for us, um, you know, to do video transport. Um, so we haven't doing we haven't been doing as much discussion testing, which I need to do more of. But um, but being able to send out those magic links and being able to just open them and output something is is pretty magical. Um, so. Uh, I've been successful at doing that. And and again, we, we want to play with it more for the interaction. Our our whole system is so tied up in Zoom. We don't use it in production, but we're but we're um, definitely playing with it a lot and it works pretty well. Uh, next question. It's from Fred Eric Eckert from Bad Herdnabe, Germany. 
What sound devices mixers support the noise assist plugin and Dante? It's all the mix pre's and above. So mix pre three, six, ten, uh, the eight series. Oh, I don't think it supports the six series. I think it's the, the I think the six series is not or the three series. So it's the eight series and the and the mix pre's, I believe. Um, uh, go ahead, uh, Peter. I'd say be careful, however. You, I mean, I think it's not all the mix pre threes because I've got a mix pre three M. No. Yeah, you need the mix pre three. Uh, mix pre three, three, three two. Da- dash two. Yeah. Yeah. All the twos. Yeah. You can't do the, yeah, the, the M or the re- or the first generation mix pre doesn't have the horsepower to do it. No, go ahead, Mitchell. And which ones have Dante also? The eight series. I think, I think all of the eight series has it. The Scorpio is the high end of the eight series, but I think that all the eight series have Dante. Go ahead, Roscoe. I put the link in. If you put your serial number in, it'll tell you whether or not the one the noise assist you have is compatible. That's great. Now, next question. Next question from Ryan Riddiman of Chicago, Illinois. How do you third gen AirPods compare to the first and second gen? Oh, they're way better. Like I, I, I only have one right now. I'm trying to find the case. The case is missing. I, I put this down. I was like, where did I put the case? Like, I don't I don't understand. Usually I lose one ear. I don't lose the case, but I've lost the case for like the last couple of weeks. So I've been using my my Gen 1s and, uh, and Gen 2s and not good. I mean, I remember when I thought that those were cool <laughs> going back and I'm trying to put it off because I keep on. I'm just terrified that Apple's going to release a new a new AirPod. And I will have just bought another case with, you know, I was going to buy another one. And that's how I have so many cop ones. I lose them and then I buy new ones and then I find them. <laughs> Usually the day after I bought the new one. And go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, some airport somewhere and they're lost and found is a bunch of uh, iPod cases and one of them has your name on it, Alex. Yeah, yeah exactly. I should have, I should, I knew I should have etched it in. <laughs> like, this is, this is me. Uh, next question. Mark Giuliani from. Washington, D.C. Alex, could you discuss how one might hold debates between local politicians using technology similar to office hours? What tools are available to sell tickets? How do you bring the candidates, panelists versus attendees? Well, I guess the one thing I would say is that you could you, you could absolutely use a webinar and webinar might actually work really well for uh, tickets or uh, this is where zoom events might might make sense because you could have a ticketing process that's there but what i would probably do is not use any other part of it i would probably just use or on zoom or whatever where you you can sell the tickets for it um if you want to sell tickets you can also just have people register to a webinar you know and just come in and be part of the webinar i really like the platform that we're using right now which is that we're in a meeting and then we have zoom iso grabbing that meeting and then we're able to switch it and add graphics and do everything else. And then we pump the output of that back into a webinar. And I think that that is a um, pretty great solution for this kind of thing. Then you need some kind of Q&A system so that the audience can ask questions um, you know, to, to that process. Now, in a traditional debate, they don't have the audience ask questions. And with politics, it could get pretty heated. <laughs> you know, so uh, so that's, that's another piece. And one of the things you can do is... Um, uh, you know, you can have something there where people just send in questions. Like we have a version of Makana that we use that I'm actually using later today that doesn't have any voting or anything else. It just lets you put questions in. It's, it's you know, it's the old crossfire kind of, you know, notes, you know, written or whatever. And so people can, you can just, put, someone just gets an interface, they hit go and it just goes into the system. And we might, like for some of our events, we'll get 300 to 600 questions in a half an hour. And then we just dig through them you know, to, to, to figure out which ones we want to ask. So you can do that as well. You don't have to do the voting on something that that's there. Now, what I what I do think is, is an opportunity is to build up communities around that. And so you have those people that get used to it. You kick out the ones that are problematic. You keep the ones that are that are thoughtful. And and then you, you can start. And, and that's why I think the future for a lot of this stuff is repetition, because what you do is as you do more and more events, it's not a one off. If you're doing a, debates, for instance, every week. What happens is, is you, again, you can see who's going to give you thoughtful questions. You can get rid of the trolls and slowly focus on a thoughtful conversation about, about it, which the key, the tricky part is, is that you want thoughtful in politics, you want thoughtful questions from both sides of the aisle. And that's a very hard thing to get for people to get their head around. If it's all an echo chamber, it, it actually loses its vibrance and it actually undermines the candidates. So in a, in a, I've done, well, we don't talk about politics in office hours. I've done a lot of politics. The best, the place that you see a great 
um, politician is when they're asked a hard question and they knock it out of the park or they even get a single out of it where you go, oh, right. You know, and um, that that's, so everybody asking questions that the pol the politician wants to answer, it, it's, it's just not very vibrant. You know, what, what, what really makes the show is someone who doesn't agree with them, testing them and then them showing their metal, you know, in the process but that person has to be appropriate, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's, you know, like, and, and that's the, and it's, and it's in our day and age, it's hard to find people that can be both disagree. I disagree with your idea, but I'm going to ask you an appropriate question to test that, that, that concept and that kind of old fashioned, uh, debate process is, is difficult to find now. And I think that people would, would gravitate towards that. I'm going to have a thoughtful conversation. And again, usually you don't bring the audience in because the audience is incapable of that, but using it, you know, being able to cull through the audience and find people that are on both sides of the aisle. I love listening to both, you know, like for me, I would pay, uh, I pay good money to, to just have a podcast every, every week that had Robert Reich and, and George Will. <laughs> like, 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 just, like, like, you know, like I don't agree with either of them all the time, but I, I love watching their gears turn, you know, like, you know, and, and so, you know, that's, you know, the, um, uh, you know, that, you know, I mean, the main reason that I watch like Sunday morning with George Stephanopoulos or whatever is because I want to see Chris Christie and Donna Brazell talk. And if they're not on, I just go, eh, I'm not going to watch. <laughs> like there's nothing, a lot of these other people aren't going to say anything that are useful. So anyway, so the, um, uh, so uh, I think finding that, that's the key is finding an engine to keep that turning. You know, that's what the, it's, it's, you know, when you write a story for a movie, it's got to be a problem. Like, you know, if everything goes well, if there's, you know, you, you know, the, uh, every, every movie is describe the tree, get them up the tree, get them down the tree. Those are the three acts, right? And, and, um, uh, you gotta get them, up the, but there's some part of a debate that has to get them up the tree. If they don't, if they don't get up the tree, they can't get down the tree. And then there's, then it's just a boring story, you know, it's, you know, and so, so that's the, you know, so I think that that's the thing you have to think about when you think about the debates is how do you, and, and I think that doing them often and having discussions often um, and finding ways that you can get both sides represented in the questions, um, just m people would gravitate towards that because it would be something that's, you know, vibrant and interesting as opposed to just an echo chamber. And that's the, that's the thing that um, our whole media infrastructure is having trouble with. <laughs> it's that no one, no one's very good at being, you know, in the middle, you know, of anything, you know, and even, even if you're to the right or to the left in the middle of that, you know, and being able to discuss those, you can have it like be all progressive back and forth conversations where there's, you know, center left to, you know, very, you know, liberal or center right to very conservative. That could be the, the range that you're covering, but, and that's a big range, you know, in those areas, it doesn't have to be all the way. Like, you know, we don't have to have, uh, you know, the most progressive to the most conservative at the same time. That's that's hard to find a middle ground. But if you, you could do some gradient up between those two and then have those be thoughtful conversations, I think you'd end up with a fun thing to watch, you know, but that's that's always the challenge. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I do enjoy it. I, again, I, I know how dangerous it is. It's, it's a very dangerous subject. So uh, I do enjoy talking about politics and the mechanics of it. Uh, we just don't do it here because it's uh, fissionable material. And I'm, I'm used to juggling uh, the fissionable material, but it's, I, I find that a lot of people get burned quickly. So, but it's, it's a good idea. I think that, I think our, our society would benefit from better debates, you know, with more people involved with the questions, you know, so, um, so hopefully you're, you'll be successful and let me know how I can help. All right. Next question. And it's from George E. Kennedy Jr., Washington, D.C., and I think it's referring to NAB. Can we visit Aperture? Yeah, we should definitely visit Aperture. Yeah, I think that the, you know, Aperture and Nanlite kind of, in my eyes, live in kind of a similar space. Um, I think that uh, Nanlite's a little more cost-effective and Aperture software is usually a little bit better. So, I, so I'd so i love to see what they're doing, and Aperture is always, I'm always excited about what they're working on. So hopefully we'll see some some good stuff there. And I think that don't, don't, isn't it the same company that does Aperture, does Deity, Deity Mics? Is that, am I correct there? I think that there might be the same manufacturer. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if both of them are in the same booth or next to each other. <laughs> so anyway, um, next question. And next question comes from Eduardo Augustine in Panama. Alex has spoken a lot about Dante Audio. How do I get started into this amazing audio routing world? I go ahead, John. Before office hours, I had no idea what Dante was. I actually had it inside of my Sure Axion has it built in without me knowing, and I bought the card 
for the X32, but go to Automate, sign up for their training classes. They have certification one, two, and three. Um, and then their tests and their training materials are fantastic. And then get an AVIO and start playing around with it. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Last question for me, and then I'm going to hand it off to Tony. And uh, interestingly enough, this one is from Tony. Tony Mobley <laughs> in Newton, Georgia. Alex, do you miss the sharing from Africa you did on Meerkat? Uh, I do. I do. I, I We'll get back there. <laughs> we'll wait for the, the COVID storm to pass, and then we'll be back into it. We just got, the school just got a new space in Rwanda. And um, and I think we might be able to even do stuff. There's, they have more bandwidth there, too. So we might try to do things where we do some more things straight out of Rwanda back to us. It's actually a pretty comfortable time for them to participate in what we're doing. So, um, so stay tuned for that. But yeah, I, I do miss it's, I think that we see a lot on the news that is, you know, crazy about Africa. And when you get there, you suddenly go, it's not like that at all. Like, you know, there, I mean, there's definitely areas that you have to be careful of, um, but not so much in like places that I go like Rwanda and Zimbabwe, but, um, uh, it's just a, you know, it's a beautiful place. There's, uh, you, you, you know, as soon as you get, it's kind of a magical, they're just, and, and it's organic. You know, it's nothing, when I did in Meerkat, one of the things I wanted to show people is like, there's, there's paint on the roads, but there's more lanes than there are paint and there, and every, and everything's like a negotiation. Everything in Africa is a negotiation. Like there, it's all just kind of, you're just kind of working through it and everyone's doing their thing and, and you figure it out and you're always surprised that so many people, not, you know, so many people survive getting to work <laughs> because it's just so much stuff, but everybody knows that it's there you know, and, um, uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing. So, so yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely, uh, hopefully do more of that. Um, I want to do as the bandwidth gets better in a lot of these countries. Um, one of the things that I, uh, want to do is go back to Zimbabwe, you know, or even I, we have contacts in Zimbabwe, but go back to some of these countries and do more with Hosmuk in, in South Africa and show people more of what's, what's there because the bandwidth is getting easier for us to show that and do that in other countries as well. All right. I have to go to a production. Tony has been so kind to uh, take over the next couple hours and host it for us. So I'm going to hand it off to Tony. Tony, take it away. Thanks so much. Oop, I think he double mic'd. Hold on, there you go. Thank you, Alex, right, so much you. for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Mopley. I do a weekly show called Conversation with Tony Mopley, and it's part of the Office Hours Network. And we're going to go to the next question from Douglas Carmichael. Thank you. I appreciate it, Tony. Uh, actually, the first one is from Hassan Ahmed in New York City. What's the meaning of term back end, which is sometimes used by panelists? Okay, so Roscoe. Sure. Well, there's a whole bunch of development that's gone on through behind the scenes. If you want to put it in those terms, also would be another word for the back end. There's a Isadora running uh, to make helping make uh, kind of artificial intelligence decision based on who's talking. Uh, um, gosh, I can't even begin. I really wish somebody could come forward who can list out all the different things. Uh, uh, Zoom ISO, I believe, is back there. Um, somebody else jump in here. Um, there's just a whole bunch of technology that's going on behind the scenes and there are people operating it, but a lot of it's been built up over time. It's been, uh, uh, you know, used and suggestions have been made about interfaces. I know Laura's had some great uh, suggestions about the, uh, for people who are, who are, uh, whose vision making it easier people who may have vision difficulties to help control the controls in, in the back end. but it's pretty much everything behind the scenes that's uh, helping program this and make it kind of look like it's all happening magically mark so i think it may be simpler than that i think sometimes we refer to the back end of zoom where you change the settings by going up to the little green shield and hitting the toolbar and there's some settings there that can be adjusted that just aren't uh, adjustable when you go to your microphone and hit the little arrow and do your audio settings or your video settings but uh, it could also be back of house or backstage. And, and that's where you have some of the tools that are being used like Zoom ISO that pulls video out and isolates it and allows you to send it down the line to a mixer where you can then do two up and three up and four up. So there's there's different, the term kind of gets used for different things. And the only thing that I would add to it is that if you are interested, Hassan, then I would encourage you to join uh, After Hours 
and find out about what's being done. And also you will have an opportunity to possibly participate in the training that we normally do for uh, 2.0 in the back end. So thank you for the great question. Next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael. I purchased the Roland soft case and there's a link to it for my Phantom 06 to protect it in transit. If I were taking it on a train or a plane, what case would you recommend for the best protection? Roscoe. I would bring a bicycle lock if I was taking a train on Amtrak because uh, when you're sleeping at night, things tend to disappear. So that's my only recommendation. I don't know a lot about this particular uh, keyboard. Thank you, Douglas. Next question. And another one from Douglas. I've been trying to get a picture if Cubase 12 meets my creative needs during the 30-day trial, but I'm concerned about being left behind, not being on the logic train. As Apple hardware software evolves, should I be worried? Well, uh, Douglas, we don't have any hands raised, so I am going to say, ask your question again in maybe a different format, and maybe we'll get some answers for that. Thank you so much for the question, Douglas. Next question. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Chris Clark from Tempe, Arizona. Watching the office hour session on being a host, it occurred to me that if more instructors in higher end education and secondary ed frame their work as good host with students as the talent, schooling would be much more successful for all. Thoughts? Roscoe. Are, are, are we doing an education hour after this, Tony? Because that was an education tag question. So I can throw something here, but I think we can also push it on to the next hour. Let's, let's push it on to the next hour. Okay. And the next question comes to us from David Brady in New York City. David asks, looking for a non-DMX yet remote controllable LED spotlight fixture for a standard track light system. Does such a thing exist? And we might need, David, that question answered with a different panel. We don't have any hands raised for that particular one. Next question. Okay, Douglas Carmichael again. I haven't been on the panel yet because my video setup doesn't pass OH 2.0 standards. For someone studying iOS app development and also interested in music sound design and IT infrastructure, what strategies would work for marketing oneself? Uh, we don't have any hands raised, but I will say this, Douglas. I think, um, all right, Eric, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think marketing is a process of you going and um, speaking with the people that you think would benefit from your service. And I think I, it goes back to what I talked about earlier with sales skills. I think sales skills are the idea that you have to take what you know, whatever that is, and you have to present it to the people you think are going to benefit. So that means picking up the phone and making a call. A lot of people think it's good enough to just send an email or a text message or chat. Um, and I found that is not the case. It, phones are an old fashioned concept nowadays, but I think phones also get something that you, you can have a conversation that's two way. You can get the emotional connection with people. And essentially, you know, as, a, as an artist, we, we tell stories, right? And in sales, that's the same thing. You're telling a story about what you can do for them, what it is that you're providing an, a solution to. And if you find the problem that actually meets your that can work with your solution, then you've got yourself a sale. And that's, I think, the the process of marketing yourself, no matter what type of environment you're working in. And uh, last thing I would say is, Douglas, think about trying different things in after hours to get on camera. And then um, getting support from the community might be able to accelerate your ability to be on camera and participate in the panel. So I would encourage you to think about that. And just remember, I'm using an iPhone, an old iPhone as my camera, and it's, it's not the best, but it's not the worst either. So um, please consider that. Next question. Roy Myers in Bel Air, Maryland, saw a commercial on YouTube this morning for the Laser World of Photonics. Looks fascinating. Unfortunately, it starts tomorrow. Anyone ever heard of this? And there's a link to it. 
John? I I must be on the same list that you're on, Roy, because I saw this ad and I also see the ads on on Facebook as well. Um, but you must be a real big, bigger nerd than I, because it looks like industrial laser kind of stuff to me. I don't know. It looks kind of dry. But good luck. Next question. And it's from Keenan Campbell in Princeton, Illinois. Um, what is the best HDMI splitter that will carry a signal over 75 feet on H HDMI cables? One in, 12, 10 to 12 out. Mitchell. I would be very careful about that because I wouldn't run a regular HDMI much over 30 feet uh, without using uh, some type of active termination on both ends or one that uh, converts to fiber. Um, once you've done that, I think it's okay to, uh, to run it through a splitter like that, but you can't depend on the splitter to make up for the, the loss in a cable that's that long. Mark. Uh, so what I was going to say is it may not be the splitter so much as the cable and the type of uh, material the cable's made out. And Mitch Mitchell kind of alluded to that. The laser cables uh, can transfer, the fiber cables can transfer that signal a little further. But I think Peter probably knows more about this than I do. Peter. I would, frankly, I'd just stay away from HDMI and either use SDI or, or fiber for the... Uh, because the signal attenuation on, on HDMI cables will get in your way at that point. Roscoe? I've actually done this with the uh, both from Monoprice. The Monoprice splitter, it's an older one. It only had to carry 1080p, so I had an old one and pulled it out. And then I used the Monoprice 75-foot cable, their uh, red mirror, I think they call it, but it's the, it's the one that Monoprice sells. And it worked just fine. Didn't have any problems with it. Thank you, gentlemen so much for that. I want to appeal to our panelists and our audience. We are low on questions and this is going to be a short hour. So please uh, put in some questions. And uh, Mitchell, let's go to the next question. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, James Fosseline of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hollywood Walk of Fame has five categories. Will social media stars have some place to mark their fame? Bill Davis. Hey, how are you? how is everybody this morning? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me eventually because Hollywood's Walk of Fame has changed a little. Originally, it was just motion picture, and then they added television and things like that. I think that's the uh, Chamber of Commerce in the area that kind of controls it. So um, their number one purpose in this is to draw tourists into the area. They've been magically successful of that. That is a really hub of entertainment all around the Los Angeles area. And so much comes from there, the uh, Oscars notably, kind of the first thing. Uh, and even with change over the course of the years, as Grauman's Chinese Theater got rebranded and rebanded, the, the Walk of Fame and all of those in concrete hand footprints and footprints has something that has drawn audiences forever. My suspicion is that if social media creates true lasting stars, and it's had a little trouble doing that, we all probably know five or six people who are really good at social media. And you know, the Marquis Brownleys and the um, I Justines of the world, but they're relatively niche as far as the wider um, audience. And so if we start seeing this become more like television so that more people watch more social media um, across the spectrum and advertisers continue to look for the audiences that they can aggregate, then it wouldn't surprise me if the some sort of an award series like that starts to sneak into the corners, but it's going to have to be somebody who becomes a household name because that's one of the things that the Walk of Fame is all about. These are household names throughout the arts, and uh, we'll see if it goes in that direction. John Preto? No, oh, very, <clears throat> very well articulated. Seems that most of these social media guys are ephemeral in their fame, and so you know they're they're big last year and then this year they're gone so i agree with what bill said mitchell hill yeah all the uh, all the before including uh, what bill said uh, which is a good synopsis of it all i i think i've found in, in certain reading stories about it or watching shows on entertainment tonight um if you have the money you can get your name in there uh as long as you've got some semblance of uh 
public notoriety. I think it's like forty thousand dollars or something. At least last I heard, to uh, be able to get in there. So add money to the uh, list of uh, qualifications. Bill Davis. Yeah, I think it's. I think Mitch is exactly right about that. It, it is. There is a certain amount of money involved and PR. Remember that that most of these media businesses run on public relations. They have always, since the early days of Hollywood, had massive PR operations behind the scenes, keeping uh, people who rely on the public goodwill in good graces with the public. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if part of having the Hollywood Walk of Fame is being connected into the public relations industry and some of the big, uh, either the agents or the public relations professionals in that, uh, that and a little bit of cash at the right time spread around probably has something to do with who gets the star. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Next question. And it's from Ryan Rademan in Chicago, Illinois. What camera do you use for office hours? Mitchell Hill. Uh, in my particular instance, I'm a Sony guy. I've got a Sony FX3, which is the low end of their Sinalta camera line, and it's way overkill, I'll admit that. But it's a full-frame camera that does this. So anything going to make me look this good is worth the money. It's about 4000 bucks plus lens. Mark? So I use a black magic design as shown here that has a, uh, has a 24 by 70 Canon lens on it. It allows me to kind of blur out the background. So you don't see my messy shelves and, uh, keep my face a little bit in focus. And I'm the opposite of Mark. I'm using a 10 S max iPhone. I'm using it with filmic pro, uh, filmic pro. And I'm actually having some issues that I'm going to get resolved in after hours. So if you are trying different things, you might want to consider participating in after hours so that you can get some help with your technology. Ethan, um, I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, you know, I just wanted to say, I, so I've got the, the Brio, but I've had a great experience with the after hours crew. Um, where I set up the Brio and the lighting wasn't right. And so I needed to figure out, all right, well, how do I get the lighting? And then I asked a question in the office hours panel of, well, what webcam settings do you use? And, and I got an answer to that. And then I was able to piece together all the different elements to change the color. Um, and it's a remarkable difference. And you, I, I think sometimes you're, you're really close with the camera you have, whatever that is, but you're missing just something. And that's where that after hours crew really helps because somebody on there will know somebody on there is listening kind of in real time. You could just throw stuff out and a conversation begins. And so I would really invite people to join it because I've experienced it firsthand. Bill Davis. After hours is astonishing. If you haven't gone in there, you really need to. Uh, so I'm, I've am i taken the entire down the rabbit hole approach. I started out with a C920 uh, Logitech little camera in my voice booth the first time I was on office hours two years ago when the show started. And I have gone through a variety of changes. I moved from there to a Brio for a little bit of time. When I decided that I really enjoyed this and I really wanted to make sense out of it, plus I, uh, what Alex talks about a good little bit, which is that your telepresence now really is uh, a business investment. Because if you look good and you sound good, people do take you a little more seriously. So what I managed to do was um, I needed to change cameras at the time. And I went all the way to a Blackmagic 6K. And I got into exploring it pretty deeply. I was in my old house and old offices. I had moved to here. Uh, and I decided to really spend some time uh, lighting, figuring out a set, figuring out a scene. And the Blackmagic 6K was a part of that. And uh, getting it dialed in right, I just figure it's an investment. Plus, I pull that camera on occasion when I have to go do shoots. And it really is a very solid modern video camera. I don't have any other video cameras now other than the 6K. Uh, although I do end up using my iPhone uh, 12 Plus about as much as I use the Blackmagic 6K for shooting projects out in the field. So that's been an interesting change too. But right now I'm on a Blackmagic 6K for this. John Preto. So fade, fade cameras. I've got a Brio and the built-in iMac, which I think looks better. This is Gen 1 Brio, and I cannot get the color set up properly on this Brio. And and over the my big boy studio, Studio C, I have a Sony A7 III. When we need to have ruthless reviews, I move over to the other studio. <laughs> <laughs> 
Peter Sargent. We can't hear you, Peter. Okay. Yeah, you just keep going, Peter. We'll hear you. It just okay. takes a minute to pull up. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I alternate. Normally, I'm uh, using a Sony AX, AX100, which is a video camera, not a repurposed still camera. It's actually a 4K video camera with HDMI, clean HDMI out. That's what I'm using today, but I have been known to use my 6K Pro at times as well. But like Bill, I, I find myself at least this last couple of months pulling it down and taking it out so much that I taking it out in the field so much that I just went back to the Sony camera for my day to day use. But it's a 4K camera and it seems to do a decent job. Eric. You know, I was going to suggest the the one thing, if you have a Mac, uh, the one thing that you can do is use your iPhone with an app called Camo, uh, C-A-M-O. And it's a fantastic app that just makes your iPhone into a great webcam. I mean, it's it's the best webcam I think you can buy. I mean, granted, it's probably $1,000 new, but um, you can use any any camera. I, I was using a 6S and it looked fantastic. The only thing it doesn't do because it's a software cam, it doesn't work with FaceTime. So if you want it, like I have a Mac mini and I don't have another camera, you can um, you can use that for um, Zoom and uh, Teams calls. We at, at the office, I use Teams, but I think that uh, using camo with an iPhone is a tremendous start and most people already can do that. And I, I just would add that uh, part of being a part of office hours is that and Tim, I, this is not mine. This is from Tim McCullough. He said that part of being a part of office hours is that you spend a lot of money on technology, but that is the cost of paying tuition for the things that we have an opportunity to learn in office hours. Next question. So true, Tony. Uh, this is a question from Mike Beardmore in Reading, UK. How are 3D printer owners applying them and what are their most successful prints? John Preto. So my rocket building partner, Perry, has, I think, five now 3D printers. And we, pr we print ex um, extensively for the parts inside of the rockets that we build. So all the electronics are all printed on boards that get assembled inside the rocket. So we use them a lot for prototyping and for production uh, rocketry. Mark? So uh, in the architecture and engineering world, for years, we made models out of what's called chipboard and X-Acto knives. And I have a lot of scars from those X-Acto exact, blades cutting across my hands. Uh, so recently, we went out and got some 3D uh, printers so that we could start to make the architectural models uh, and show people them. Because it's interesting. Even as we go more and more virtual and you can put on the goggles and walk through the building, people still want to hold something in their hand and turn it around and look at it. Uh, it gives them some sense of what what they are you know buying conceivably from the designer and i want to do a shout out to chris fenwick in that on wednesday night i had a conversation with lawrence nelson and he is a uh, training director for the state of georgia and if you're interested in in the conversation please go back and watch it but the reason i'm bringing him up is that he said that part of his hobby is that he works with woodworking and that the woodworking he has a device and he said i can't remember the exact name of it but what it does is it does the 3d printing like work for carving and so um that was very interesting to me and so i i'm doing a shout out to chris fenwick if you uh are familiar with that please share that let us know. Next question. By the way, Tony, I think that's called a CNC machine. It's the same thing that you see. That is it. That is. Thank you, Mitchell. It's a CNC wow. machine. Next question comes to us from Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. What is your office hour ex experience in exploring improving your streaming setup? How much money have you spent at the suggestion of other office hour community members? Mitchell. I built my uh, Zoom room as it's as it sits here, and I know it's overkill, but my intention was uh, to build the very best looking Zoom 
uh, experience that I, I at the time knew. Um, and I spent, I don't know, about $20,000 to get this far. And <clears throat> I'm happy with it. I know that my camera is an overkill for it, but, you know, I can just lift it off anytime and take it out on a shoot if I need it. But um, since I've joined Office Hours almost exactly a year ago, um, I've done other things to improve it, uh, primarily in the audio side. And uh, for muting and unmuting my Zoom button, I've spent like $1,000 uh, on a studio technology. 205 is what, what Alex uses. And also using Dante and that same switch to talk to uh, Unity, which is our back-end communication system. So I think it's going to continue to evolve, and so is my wallet. But um, I get great advice here that I trust implicitly, and I recommend anybody else to do the same. Bill? I, I've i spent, other than the camera, which was a pretty hefty investment, I think I bought it right after the Blackmagic Pocket 6Ks were dropped from uh, near $3,000, their original price, to down to 2000 And uh, so that was a pretty hefty chunk up front. From that point on, I decided I was going to try to do this truly on a budget and use more intelligence than just throwing raw money out of it. Let me see if I can switch to an alternate view. So that's the lighting grid and array that I have on the background that you see now. And those may look like really professional fixtures up there or something. They are not. Um, I've got some Manfrotto auto poles that I bought used from a company that had used them in a fashion show. And I would like the fact that they're white, most of them. I've got a couple of silver ones in there, obviously. But each of those instruments was about 20 bucks off of uh, off of eBay or off of, uh, oh, what is the other uh, thing, a Craigslist. They were not particularly expensive. The thing is, I had to understand how to arrange them and modify them so that they got what I want. Those are little spotlights. And each one of them now, I don't know if you can see it on the actual shot, but each one of them has uh, clipped onto it with gaffer's tape, a diffuser and a neutral density filter so I could get the light level down to where I want it because those inexpensive lights do not dim like the expensive lights and they don't use the right kind of pulse code modulation. So you get flickering and stuff like that if you try to if you try to throw them less electricity than they had originally. So each one of those probably represents under $20 of investment. So I would say my whole rig at this point probably is down around $2,500, uh, if you consider the cameras the first 2000 to 2700 somewhere in that zone. Um, just because I shopped used, I try to keep things cheap, and I try to use more understanding of lighting than just go out and put a uh, a fixture that might cost seven or eight hundred dollars that would do all of these things better, but I just didn't want to throw that into where I am. So that was my approach. Eric, you know, I, my office hours journey started actually about two years ago when office hours started, but I I lurked around for a long time. Uh, I work in an organization, a sales organization, and of course during the pandemic you can't go visit customers on site, so we use Teams. Uh, now, Teams, I think, isn't quite up to speed with uh, the way that uh, Zoom is. However, in Teams, there's a lot you can do. And I so I started kind of building my uh, infrastructure around creating a great experience for the customers that I was working with. Uh, there are often complex drawings and conversations that we have. And I didn't want to have PowerPoint presentations just show up. And so little by little, asking questions of the panel over time, I actually started putting together those pieces um, and little by little, it, things really improved. And so getting more and more information is really helpful. Once I joined After Hours, the amount of information you get is such, it's like a fire hose, right? And so you're, you're standing in front of the fire hose and you immediately start emptying your wallet into, well, I've got to get audio hijack and I've got to get loop back, which I have no idea how to use. And then, well, I probably need a better microphone and then this, uh, uh, this interface I have is is too noisy and I want to do some other things that, you know, it's immediately everything begins to to add up quickly. So I think like Bill, it makes sense to take it um, a step at a time and to figure out exactly what it's doing for you. And in my case, it meant more sales. It meant more opportunities. And I think if you're working in that space, it really makes sense to spend money on it because it, it will pay back. Mark. So I've learned a considerable amount being part of this group, office hours and after hours. And I think the question isn't how much have I spent, but how much have I saved? Because if I were to have done this on my own, 
uh, I wouldn't have known what to get. And I would have done the research and development for my company would have been 100% spent on trying to figure all of this out. So I think working with the group that's here, it's helped me at least focus what the important things are, you know, having good sound, good quality audio, having good lighting and, and not just going out and buying what you think might work and playing with it, but being in after hours and asking the right questions and that kind of focuses your budget. Thank you, sir. Uh, Peter Sargent. In, in my case, I would I would very much agree with uh, with Mark. I mean, for me, this has been a case of um, avoiding false starts because I, I listen, I ask questions, and then I go invest. On the opposite side of that question, you know, I I don't know about you know you know Eric in his world, but in my role in the consulting world, it was not unusual for me to go out and once a year go out and spend you know, three three k on a couple of suits. Well, guess what? I've probably spent that much twice over on equipment over the last two years. So I think I kind of broken even because I haven't been wearing suits while I've been traveling. Uh, yeah, um, I, I I guess I'm probably the novice when it comes to uh, some of the expense that you guys have done in the past. I am a person who was not a video person at all. And I came on, and most of you know my story, I came on office hours with a 2012 MacBook Pro, horrible lighting. My wife was, at the beginning of the pandemic, my wife was working at the kitchen table, and I was in the bedroom, horrible lighting, terrible silhouettes, and you guys let me hang around in the early days, and it was a lot of fun. And so um, she has allowed me to spend some of my money on some equipment. So I have two nice monitors and I have a couple of iPads and I had a person that gener generously donated this, this microphone that I'm using this PR 40 because they wanted me to have one. And um, I'm using a fantastic uh, teleprompter that was also donated to me by the community of office hours. And so I am able to look directly into the camera and have great eye lining and um, look pretty good. And my sons gave me some like some great lights for Christmas, and I had two newer lights that I purchased. And it's you know for a guy who doesn't know too much about video production, um, but ask a lot of questions and offers hours because I was trying to help a community a small community church, get better and navigate the pandemic. Um, not too bad, not too shabby. And so uh, I, I'm thankful. Again, it's, it's about paying the tuition for, for the education that you're receiving in office hours. Next question. Looking good, Tony. Uh, next question comes from J.J. McKenna in San Rafael, California. After watching Josh Brolin's interview on First We Feast Hot Ones, he frequently commented on the quality of questions. What research methods would one use to find golden nuggets to help make for better interaction with interview shows? Roscoe? Well, Tony, I've done this on your show even. Uh, always look at person people's, uh, uh, I want to say resumes, uh, what are they called? Cura vitae. Uh, you know, they're, what they present about themselves, you know, and so especially in anything online, because if you go in and you say, oh my gosh, they can ride a unicycle and you start to talk to them about that, obviously they're going to be knowledgeable and passionate about that. And that just makes for a great answer to a question. How you're going to phrase a question about unicycles, I don't know, or sword fighting, or find those things that the people have done in their past or are passionate about speaking about and, and use those, bring those out in questions. You'll get a great interview. Bill. 100% what Roscoe said. It is about an interaction between one person and another person. If you are truly curious about that person and uh, have any resonance with who they are, you're in a position where you can reveal that for your audience. And that is really your central job is to figure out 
if I were out there watching this show, what would I want to know about this person? And that's why the listening part of interviewing somebody is always so incredibly important. Yes, you should always prepare as many topic areas and research the biography of that person and know something, even if it's just the bare minimums about the industry they're in or the topic that's going to be discussed on the show. But at heart, it comes down to you and one other person sitting across from each other and having a discussion. So if you are curious about them, your audience will be satisfied, I think, by your curiosity, because that's going to reveal who they are. And that's what the audience is tuning in to see. Absolutely. Um, I, I just want to add that this coming week, Bill Davis is going to be on Conversation with Tony Mobley. And greatly and looking wanted, forward to it. And and thank you so much for agreeing to, for being, uh, agreeing to be on Conversation with Tony Mobley. I want to say that part of what I do for Conversation with Tony Mobley is everything that's already been said in terms of reaching out and getting as much information as you can about the person who's going to be on your panel. But one, the, other, the other thing that I do is that I have a conversation with that person, um, no pressure, just an outright conversation before they appear on Conversation with Tony Mobley. So that's one of the things that I do because a lot of times the conversation that you have with that person during, uh, during leading up to their actual appearance on your show and the conversation that you have with persons when you're doing camera and mics checks also will inform the conversation that you have um, prior to uh, the actual show. So um, those are things that I have done and those things, those things have worked for me. And I think in, in some ways have improved the quality of the conversation that I have on Conversation with Tony Mobley. And we'll go to the next question. And the next question comes from Eduardo Augustine in <clears throat> Panama. <clears throat> it's a frog in my throat, excuse me. How is Tony using his mic, condenser dynamic, in his iPhone X? Mitchell. I don't think he's using uh, the mic in his... I'm not using my voice either. <clears throat> um, I think you're using that PR40 that's sitting there in front of you. Absolutely. Into, into our preamp, you're using the sound devices... Um, Bill, we're going to go to Bill. Well, I okay. just wanted to know, yeah, the interface is always troubling for me because I try to get mics into my iPhone and I have a ceremonic rig that I finally found that uses a lightning connector. So it takes an XLR cable feed in, whether that's dynamic or, or condenser and changes it into a lightning that the phone can see so that I can get my audio into that. But I wondered what you use, Tony, because I don't, you know, what's your, what's your interface between the professional microphone world and the iPhone incoming world? So when I initially started using the iPhone, I was actually using the pile mic and I was plugging it directly into the A10 mini. And that's the way um, I was using the microphone setup with the iPhone. But since now I'm using the PR40, the PR40 is actually going into the Zoom H6. And the Zoom H6 is my interface for audio. And in after hours, with the help of Mickey, I was able to get um, the, the delay set up because the the audio and the video were not in sync. So Mickey helped me and um, several other After Hours members helped me get the sync so that, and Clylock, and 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 uh, Mickey was telling me in my ear that Clylock, I, I had forgotten about Clylock. And so the, the, the audio and, and my syncing is together based on audio hijack and loopback. And um, that is what I'm doing. And Bill, you want to come back? No, I think that was that that was I, I, it just he's the community here is astonishing. And the fact that we get these people and Mickey and Tlaloc are are both easily in this thing. These people who are so good at their niches and are so generous in terms of heart and spirit that they are happy to spend some time with somebody helping them through troubles that 
these pros have long since moved past. I mean, you know, both of them are working at the highest ends of complex industries, doing audio for things like the Olympics and, and other things. And yet here, because of the Office Hours community, they're happy to come back and uh, spend some time with each of us trying to help us get over the hump. That, that just shows you that for many people, they, they do not forget how it was in their early days, and they're more than happy to share from their hearts what they've learned along the way with others. It's the best part of what Office Hours has been built upon. And I, I will add that if you are a participant and watching this conversation that's taking place right now, I encourage you to jump in because they are there are superstars in their various industries that are helping um, the community out. And these superstars don't mind helping you because look, I'm just a regular old guy, retired teacher for, that lives in Noonan, Georgia on the outside sides of Atlanta. And I am actually able to have conversation with people all over the world. And I have experts that helped me help a small little church in Macon, Georgia. And it's because I'm a part of this community and these experts and superstars don't mind helping you. And so this is, and I'm not really trying to get on the, the, uh, <laughs> the office hours church uh, ministry right now, but I will say that a lot of the things that are happening in this community are unusual. And Alex's mandate of uh, a community where no one is left behind, it's not perfect, but we are working toward that goal. And so I would encourage you to participate in office hours and in after hours and glean as much as you can for from this community. And Eric, I, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say um, one of the easiest ways to get audio into an iPhone is Apple's little dongle. Um, it looks similar to this one, um, but it has a power connector, a lightning power connector as well. And you want that one if you're going to plug an audio interface into it uh, or a USB microphone. And that's just because your iPhone doesn't produce enough power in order to run that particular uh, component. So I've done that a fair amount. And uh, Tony was talking about Filmic. Filmic actually is a really good app for combining those two things together. And in fact, we just shot a little video um, recently at a nonprofit I was working with, and that's exactly how we did it. We went out of a Filmic on an iPhone 13 Pro, and we had the audio directly into uh, the side. And the audio came through very nice, and it was all timed up, and, and you didn't have to really think about it. I think that dongle's maybe $30 or $40. And I would just add uh, to what Eric just said, please get the Apple adapter. Take it from someone who knows, don't get a non-Apple and don't even consider the Apple certified ones, get the authentic Apple adapter. It makes a difference and you'll save money. You'll buy once, cry once. Next question. Great advice. Uh, first question here from Harshid in Daytona Beach, Florida. PR40 versus RE20, those are microphones. The variable on the RE20 seems to be a useful feature for a 11, I'm not sure what Accessibility. that is. Accessibility. Accessibility, thank you. Or any other suggestions? Roscoe. Yeah, um, I guess as you lean in and you get the proximity effect, if you, the variable D, which is the uh, the uh, way that way back Electro Voice decided to uh, take out the proximity effect from their RE20s, um, I guess that's what he's hoping is more helpful to people who need uh, maybe need a microphone placed right next to them, I guess, because maybe they can't move their heads or something around. But uh, so sure. I think uh, anytime you're, you can do something for somebody to help them with their accessibility, great. And uh, other than that, I'd say I'm using a Samsung, what is this? Oh, no, sorry, a Shure uh, MV. And that was a suggestion I got here from, I think it was Mickey suggestion for people. Works wonderful also. So that'd be my only other suggestion. Mitchell Hill. Uh, the main difference between those two mics, the PR40 and the RE20, uh, the RE20 is more of a, uh, a non-directional 
broadcaster's microphone. It works well. You can get on it and off it, and it works pretty well. The PR40 got to work it pretty close, and uh, it's good for rejecting a lot of side and back noise. So um, for uh, for a lot of uh, podcasts, you're going to see a lot of those PR40s being used. John Proto. Two, two great comments from, from my my uh, gentleman friends here uh, i own both those mics the re20 needs a lot of preamp just just remember that bill davis and i just want to make sure i i started in radio a long time ago and uh one of my first gigs i was a kind of a itinerant voiceover guy I would go to studio after studio after studio probably 15 of them around the phoenix area where i grew up and each time i walked in i had no clue what mic was going to be hanging in front of me and i probably used 20 different ones and when i got out of the uh, session with each one of them the spots got cut they went on the air there are differences and it's great to learn about your tools and this is important but thinking that you can't do a job until the right mic is in front of you is bad thinking most all of them work really well and don't let the tool be the stopper for doing what you want to do use what you can get try to find something that's reliable but don't focus on that that's not the thing that makes the difference between a good performance or a bad performance and we'll go to the next question and it's from jj mckenna in san rafael california which education path did you various panelists, did the various panelists, use to get into their respective fields? And are they working in the fields they wanted to at the onset of their education? Uh, Mitchell Hill. Okay. Um, I kind of fell into being in broadcasting. Um, I was doing a lot of it in high school. Uh, the school I went to allowed me the time outside to... Uh, experiment at the local radio station. So when the time came to make the decision to go to college, I selected a great college, um, Annenberg Communications at Syracuse University. And I think I've told this story before, on the way back uh, driving, my dad said, is this really what you want? And I said, I don't think so. Uh, I think that I could probably pick up a lot of what I need to know just by doing it. And um, luckily I already had a job in a local radio station. So I took that and leveraged that into uh, career, but that's that's an unusual circumstance, especially today with so much technology, that um, you can't just necessarily fall into it. But recognize where your talents are and follow your heart, because that will be the path that you end up following. John Prado, JJ, thank you for the question. This is uh, interesting because early on, I have a, a, a double E, and then I also have a, a business degree as well. One of my professors says, my job here is to teach you how to learn. We're going to teach you how to learn because your half-life of college is three to five years. So you have to continue to educate yourself and, and, uh, and reinvent yourself. And I'm going to basically just amen what John just said in that um, I initially went to college to play basketball. That was my whole motivation for going to college. And I got injured. And that was the end of that. And so I went to work for about six years and then ended up going back to college where I was focused and I was able to, and this is kind of an interesting story in that, um, but I'll make it real quick. I actually majored in religion and philosophy and I got a minor in sociology, English, and I can't think of what the last one is, uh, a music. <laughs> and uh, I actually, I would say, I actually ended up working in those fields because I've always done, I've been a teacher, I've been a social worker, I've been a case manager, I've been uh, a person who had their own computer repair business. And I've also been a caterer. And so at one time in my life, I could actually, and photographer. So at one time I could do a full fledged wedding. I could marry you. I could cater your food and I could, and I could uh, take your, your pictures. And so I could do all of those things at one time. So. Oh, Bill. That's fabulous. That's a great story. Um, 
So I uh, originally started at, at in college as a composition and theory major in the music department, and I realized really quickly that I just wasn't good enough, and I w- even if I worked at it really hard. Plus, I looked out and I saw there probably wasn't a lot of uh, real jobs for that at the time. So I switched, and I went out of the university system into the community college system for a very specific reason. I was getting interested in radio, and it was the only place that had a third-class FCC license program. So I went through that so that I could have the ticket so I could get an overnight job on the air. Because in those days, if you had a third class, you could take meter readings. They didn't have to have an engineer on staff. And so a lot of us who got into radio in those days, that's how we did it. We got our certificate. Once you were a third class engineer, you could work overnight. And I did that for six or seven months. Then all of a sudden, I started getting moved up. I was in afternoon drive for a while. Then I realized that there was no money in that either. So the one thing where I was getting paid extra was to do commercials and things like that. So I left the education system entirely without a degree and went into producing commercials for the people and literally found myself self-employed then and never went back to work for anybody else for the rest of my life. It was just one of those things. Eric. You know, when I was in college, what I wanted to do was get a degree that would help me for uh, the future of learning, because I, I kind of have this philosophy that um, everything is actually connected. Um, if you have a skill and you can sell, then you can work in almost any field doing it. If you have a skill with technology, especially nowadays, you can work in almost any field. And so the idea was to try to figure out um, how, you know, what the baseline philosophy was that I was, you know, that I was building. And so I majored in economics, but I've always really loved broadcast media and radio. I did some radio when I was young at 16. I had, I was on a weekly show on the local radio station. I got to do filling parts. I even got to interview like uh, legendary voiceover artist, Don LaFontaine before he died. Um, he was a phenomenal guy and a tremendous interview. Uh, but I got to know people like Joe Cipriano, who, you know, kind of did the Food Network voiceovers, and he was the voice of Fox for, I don't know, 13 years. Um, so I really had that kind of connection to media and broadcast. And uh, over time, you know, the skills that I had lent itself more to the corporate world in the technology space, but media and broadcast is a love. And so I've done it on the side in little bits and pieces. And I think everyone should do that, right? Find what you love even if it doesn't always pay the bills. Peter Sargent. Well, first of all, I'm going to you know, agree and ask John a, a side question, which is I, I, I like him start off with a double E degree. Uh, I can't say that I've used Diffie Q differential equations in the last 35 years, but uh, <laughs> uh, it is you, the half life is probably about five years of after after doing that. But I truly started off even entering the university system knowing what I wanted to do. I got introduced as some of her, her earlier in this show. I got introduced to big to computers back in Bellingham, Washington at Western Washington State College, by the way, it was it was Western Washington State College back then. And it was the what you would see on old TV shows and movies. It was lots of spinning tapes and flashing lights and buttons you pushed and things like that. But they took up the size of a large house. Uh, And I have worked on those things my entire career. Um, You know, I retire in in at the end of June, but uh, uh, and and I've kind of morphed into this. Doing work, you know, again, it's a technology-oriented thing. Working with with the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts to try and push, you know, push what they do for a living and get get things out that way. So, that's me. Mark Giuliani. So, um, I am. My mom was a drama major, and she didn't never went into drama. She became a teacher. My father is an architect, and so he started his own practice. So, as a little kid i got to go around job sites at airports and watch terminals get built and be around the airplanes and really uh found that fascinating when i went to high school i really wanted to be a football player the only thing is everybody kept growing except me so i was too small to play football (laughs) so i did i was very fortunate i went to a high school that had the second largest theater in washington dc behind the kennedy center 
And Andy and Jonathan both went there as well, much later, of course. But uh, I became the stage manager and became very interested in, in stage and things like that. Went on to business school, studied architecture, uh, got a master in architecture and took over my father's firm. And then many years later, halfway through my father's career as an architect, he started investing in radio stations with some of his friends that were in the broadcast industry. So now I find myself running some radio stations as well as an architecture and engineer. So I'm mixing the two together and it all bounces back to not being big enough to play football. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael. In this circa 2013 video from the Barclay Center in New York City, there's a link to it, the engineer is seen using a 360 systems instant replay. Are these still used or has QLab eclipsed it? Mitchell. Well, in the beginning, in the dark ages of radio, we used things called cart machines, and they were just uh, endless loop uh, carts, cartridges that had tape in them. Um, and they were wonderful. They, uh, you, you'd throw them in the machine, you push the play button, <clears throat> and they would play audio. Um, the 360s, in some cases, replaced cart machines, which were a strictly analog device. 360 was the first time you got a hard disk to uh, play back audio. Um, I don't see them being used that much anymore. I think what you're going to see, actually, instead of the QLab, you're going to see a thing called a Vox Pro, uh, which was a uh, standalone device made uh, that worked with a Macintosh. Um, now it uh, works on both Wheatstone uh, markets it now, and it's a editor uh, playback device that operates like a cart machine. But <clears throat> on the air, most radio stations are automated, so all this audio is being played off of hard drive now. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, I just want to say to Douglas, great questions. I encourage you to figure it out to get on the panel. We would benefit by you being on the panel. So I encourage you to think about that. Uh, we're going to have to push some of the questions back to thank you guys for, for putting in the question. We were low on questions, but we're going to push some of them back to your notes. Uh, next question. And it's from Apul Patel in Los Angeles, California, looking to get a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K Pro. I'm a little wary about making a large purchase like this through Amazon's third-party sellers. What online or L.A. local retailers would the panel trust with making this purchase? Mark Giuliani. So I've had a lot of luck with one of the panelists here and the DVE store. And uh, it's great because they live this and they understand what's out there and and they can help you with your budget and what you can afford and point you in the right direction so i all i would say the dve store is a great option and you can lift up the name of the person if you want to mark guy cochran john Preto. dve store plus one on that so i've bought in black magic equipment from um from guy his his guy <laughs> at the store um guy's the owner but i think he'll give you a discount if you mention office hours on there as well so i'm not sure about that but i thought he said that on office hours once and um i think they're i don't know if they're in stock or not that's going to be a problem peter sergeant I'll, I'll, I'll add, make it a, a triple play. I mean, I bought my 6K through Guy at the DVE store. I will admit that I bought the lenses because the the flip side is Guy can't doesn't carry Canon lenses. So I used B&H Photo to get the, the lenses for it. But uh, I would vote for the DVE store for the camera itself. Okay, Mitchell Hill and Bill, we're going to be real quick. All right, uh, fourth uh, plus for uh, DVE store, and then the backup is, as uh, Peter just said, um, D and H. D and H has everything. Bill, my six K that I'm looking at right now came from Guy at the DVE store. And, you know, you just you get. To, there are some scoff laws out there. Guy is definitely not one of them. So at least I know I'm going to be completely taken care of. If anything goes wrong, he'll fix it. I believe that, and that's been my experience. Next question. Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. What are people using for live data displays and to Zoom live streams, uh, like uh, poll answers, et cetera? 
I believe office hours space linked into SPX successfully. Would you recommend if you couldn't get Tuomo to fly over? <laughs> John Proto. So it, was a, it was a little more complex than that. We had to write our own parser. We get the data streamed down on the 70 centimeter band. And then we had our own parser and then we fed that into SPX. It took a lot of work to make it happen. Next question. And Morgan Price from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. If you're going out into the field for the first time to do a one-on-one -on -one audio interview for a podcast, what type of microphone would you lean towards and why? I see shotguns, omnidirectionals, both recommended. Roscoe and Bill, real quick. SM58 or some sort of dynamic microphone, I'd want to, I'd, I wouldn't want anything that's going to pick up a lot of background sound. Bill? Plus one on that. I use an EV635, uh, the long handled one, if you can get it. There's also the Bayer M58. You need a dynamic interview microphone. If you're going to do one back and forth, if you're going to control it, if there's two people, you want to get two of them and, and keep them close to the mouth. But it's a good mic to do that with. Next question. Can't hear you, Mitchum. My button got stuck. From Tlaloc Miguel Lopez Waterman in Salisbury. Tony, how was your first time hosting office hours? It is uh, it's a great experience and very different from Conversation with Tony Mopley. Uh, I'm excited and I'm thankful for all of the great help that I've had for this first time hosting. Next question. And next question, as we head down the uh, finish line, <clears throat> my voice too, um, Apul Patel from Los Angeles is a follow-up with NAB coming up. Will prices for the Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema Camera 6K Pro come down a little? Roscoe Jones. Yeah, since uh, it's already here, NAB's here, I would think prices would have already dipped if they're going to have to unload inventory based on some new camera coming in. So I'm going to say no, they're not going to drop in price, but you never know. Blackmagic is kind of in that one more thing once in a while. Bill Davis. The prices will take a little bit of a hit if a new model in that particular niche comes out. If they do the 6K Extreme or something like that, and it has more features with the same thing, or if uh, the next whatever jump, 8K, 12K, whatever, comes out at the same price point, that'll push the one below it down. Those are the only factors I would consider. Thank you all so much for this great hour that we've had. We're going to say goodbye to YouTube. We're going to continue education hour. It will be only on Zoom. Thank you so much. Take care. Join us in after hours. Goodbye. Just a note, after hours won't start until after education hour. Okay, guys. Um, educators, please come in. And let's let's start back at can we start back at twelve ten or twelve fifteen? How about nine fifteen on the west coast? West coast, yeah. I'm sorry. Nine fifteen west coast. Twelve fifteen east coast. Great. All right, guys. And and who's gonna do the mic check for the educators coming in? If there's another host, they're absolutely uh, will absolutely to do it. If they don't, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be leaving now. Thank you, Tony. Congratulations, great job. And uh, Bill, if you're willing to hang in here, uh, 